More than a year after the coronavirus pandemic ground global business to a halt, the world is still struggling to find its way back to pre-COVID-19 activity. Every single sector was affected by the lockdowns and restrictions. Many politicians and leaders have been hoping that the world would move from the great lockdown to the great economic rebound. But that is not happening for everyone, and it's not happening at the same pace. In fact, it may not actually happen for some as 2021 winds down. By the end of this year or into early 2022, PricewaterhouseCoopers says that it expects the global economy to revert to its pre-pandemic level of output. However, this picture masks a very uneven pattern. At one end of the spectrum is the Chinese economy, which is already bigger compared to its pre-pandemic size. And on the other hand are mostly advanced economies like the UK, France, Spain, Germany, and Japan, which are unlikely to recover to their pre-crisis levels before the end of the year. The International Monetary Fund's global forecast for 2021 released in July also supports this direction. It puts the global growth forecast at 6%, upgrading its outlook for the United States and other wealthy economies by cutting estimates for developing countries who are struggling with surging COVID-19 infections. The divergence is based largely on better access to COVID-19 vaccines and continued fiscal support in advanced economies while emerging markets face difficulties on both fronts. Today, we're looking at the world economic outlook as 2021 starts wrapping up. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adila Rubalogo. Welcome. This is Business Edge. Joining me on today's show is Inamdi Nwizu. He's the co-managing partner of Commercial Partners. Inamdi, welcome back to Business Edge. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So entering into 2021, there was a bit of, um, I guess we'd say, cautious optimism in terms of how global economy and global recovery would come hand in hand. Particularly for you, were you optimistic about the situation entering into this year, into 2021, following a year of lockdowns and restrictions? Uh, yes, I was, because the uh, general belief for me was that you're going to see uh, economy start to pick up going into 2021, considering the fact that we're coming from a very uh, turbulent 2020. And really, I think we're at a point where it does going to get worse. Uh, and also expected that to see some GDP growth, considering the fact that we're coming from a low base 2020 also, and uh, it's really played out that way. We started to see could oil recover, we started to see vaccine rollouts, so which is helping to prevent economies as well. So, uh, yes, uh, I believe that things are definitely going to be better this year than last year. All right, so in terms of your own expectations, have they played out? Well, uh, to some extent, yes. Um, if I start to look at maybe Nigeria, for instance, uh, and hope that things will be better than they are, we'll hope for a faster vaccine rollout, which will actually help, uh, which will more open up the economy. We've seen the resistance to, uh, the only thing I've seen that really has affected my expectation really has a bit of resistance to people taking vaccine, but not just Nigeria, but globally. And that has sort of slowed down things for you. We have to look at the economic growth, I think a lot of countries are meeting you know, the targets that were set with regards to GDP uh, growth. Even Nigeria um, better than its forecast initially. Mm -hmm. So let's expand the conversation a bit with um, the relationship between vaccines and recovery. Close to 40% of the population in advanced economies have been fully vaccinated, compared with 11% in emerging market economies and a tinier fraction in low-income developing countries. And the um, vaccinated populations in these developed economies are what's are is basically what's helping their forecast to look better than the rest of the world. What's that relationship, particularly on the on the output level, on a global business level, between vaccination campaigns, how successful they are in country, and how an economy can recover? So uh, basically, we all know that everybody's trying to step up to it, and the science has shown that the COVID vaccine helps with regards to reduce 
risk of infection. And also, basically helps you uh, suffer less if you still do get infected. So, avoid hospitalization in most cases. So, when you see the vaccine rollout and a lot of people are taking the vaccine and we have an infected rollout, then what it means is that people are more willing to come out, more willing to go to work, more willing to go to the shops. You can open your economy faster. If you look at China, for instance, and they are trying to stamp out that there are no uh, COVID. You know, measures that they've started implementing. You see that once they have a case, they tend to shut down a particular area, like they did with their port of in Shenzhen. So, when you look at that, it tells you that look, if people are, more people are vaccinated and you have less incidences of COVID, then you have uh, lower, uh, less need to shut down, which naturally sets back the various economies and the various areas. So, there's a direct link between getting the COVID vaccine and how businesses you know, tend to operate. So even bringing people back into the offices will be based on the COVID vaccine. Even tourism, we recently had the UK release a number of uh, countries, at least of a number of countries that they don't need to quarantine. If they come to uh, fly into the UK, as long as they have no just of their vaccine, that even shows you, because if you come in, typically you expect them to quarantine for about eight days, and avoiding that means that economics, uh, economic capital faster, more people will need to travel. So the whole vaccine thing basically does help countries start to get back on their feet, help people feel more comfortable, being close to each other, and help the economy start to pick up. Okay. Um, let's look at another economic outlook. So in December of 2020, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development projected an unemployment rate of about 7% in its member states compared to the pre-pandemic levels of 5.5%. Now, most of the jobs affected are likely to be those at the bottom end of the earnings distribution, which unfortunately is going to exacerbate income inequalities. Do we expect an eventual shift from governments from fighting the COVID-19 virus to then dealing with the higher unemployment rates uh, that have come about as a result of the lockdowns and restrictions? Yeah, for sure, so I do, definitely. Uh, we've seen, I mean, look at Nigeria, for instance, despite the rising COVID cases, despite the fact that this had and we had where last year, Around the same time last year, we still see businesses opening up, we still see the economy of you know, governments. It, governments are generally not as willing to shut down as they were before. So, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world. They've seen the impact the shutdown had on the economy. They've seen uh, how we disrupted trade, we've seen how we disrupted people's use of livelihood. And even if you look at it, so we have the work of home policy and work of home works better for those who have corporate jobs, nine to five jobs. So if you're, say, uh, someone who works in a restaurant and you clean the restaurant floors and the restaurant is shut down, then I mean, it affects you definitely, which is why you see that the lower earning people are more affected by the shutdown uh, and impact of COVID than the people who are you know, more in the corporate world. Transportation, they have a shut, shutdown there, that means Competition sector, for instance, shuts down people who earn uh, daily, you know, like uh, wages, definitely can't get anything at all. But those who are working for home are working for the corporate sector, continue to work. Mm. So it's a uh, very rational that makes a lot of sense. All right. So when we fast forward, so as we started this, I asked you about uh, being optimistic for the beginning of the 2021 year. And now we're looking yeah. at rounding things up. We've entered the last quarter of the year. The global economy is entering it. We're all able to see some of the progress and increases that other economies are making. How would you describe the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on businesses and the price of goods and services in this particular year? So you've mentioned um, workers in the more informal sector or workers outside yes. of the nine to five situation. But when we look at outputs and supply and demand and how those things are shaping up internationally, you've also mentioned tourism. A lot of African countries depend highly on tourism for a large part of their uh, foreign revenue. That's been impacted. So even though this is the year where some lockdowns were lifted, some restrictions were lifted, vaccines rolled out, there's still the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic with us. So what impact would you say it's had in this year? Well, I, I would say it's disrupted the supply chain pretty uh, badly. So we've seen shortage of chips, we've seen increased price of uh, 
transportation, so a container, for instance, transportation of a container from Asia to Europe has gone up about tenfold. And you have to look at, uh, say, from US to China, they're about fivefold. And you can link that to things like, you know, yes, apart from the Suez, uh, Suez Canal blockage, they've also had the closure of the terminals in Shenzhen when they had COVID cases. Um, you've seen things like high inflation and interest rates based on the uh, amount of liquidity that we pumped into the economy by various governments, which has also increased the cost of you know, manufacturing and poor. You've seen huge inflationary pressures coming up. Uh, you've seen China, which is one of the major uh, people when it comes to manufacturing and poor, beyond Shenzhen, uh, shut out the port in Shenzhen uh, city. You've seen all sorts of shutdowns from them around various schemes. Anything related to COVID, they tend to quickly shut down. So we've seen those disruption continue. We've seen prices of goods go up. We've seen, uh, like I mentioned earlier, prices of container delivery go up. And uh, until we can get some of these things sorted out, we continue to see that impact on the various uh, sectors, the high inflation, high interest rates, and continue to see possibly loss of jobs of course. All right, Zinamdi, um, hold on. We're going to go on a break, but you've brought up this issue of inflationary pressures, and I want us to address that uh, when we come back from the break. Then also, how long do we really expect the pressures and the issues around uh, the pandemic to be with us? Many have said the recovery will not be estimated or it won't be recorded in quarters. It will be recorded in years in terms of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. But that part of the conversation will continue. When we come back, we continue to look at the impact of the coronavirus pandemic pandemic as the world economic outlook for 2021 dims and the world starts wrapping up another year with COVID. with me is Inamdi Nwizu, co-managing partner of Commercial Partners. Now, Inamdi, before the break, you have brought up the conversation have, uh, happening around inflationary pressure, and that's something that is of concern, but I'm not sure how much concern across the globe. So we've, we've seen inflation rise across many African states because of the consequences of the pandemic. But while inflation pressure may be transitory due to the supply and demand uh, mismatches, some of which we've highlighted here, one major concern is whether or not supply bottle next will be long lasting causing inflation expectations to become more unanchored before it comes from transitory to persistence so what are your thoughts on this what do we need to be anticipating when it comes to inflation across um, many of the economies here on the continent i think we need to factor in what has happened you know what the central banks have done to try and spoil the economy back most of them have spent uh, had a sort of easing we had US spend trillions of dollars trying to you know, kickstart the economy. We had the uh, United Kingdom, we had the Bank of England, we had the uh, European Central Bank, we had African countries, you know, their own central banks all train money, right? Or spending money like it's going out of fashion, all looking for ways to kickstart you know, economies based on or due to the shutdown that they had in 2020. Now, as long as you have the excess liquidity there uh, and that money looking for places you know, to go into, then you definitely continue to see that inflationary pressure exist. Now, this is so basically you are in a situation where at the point where you have cost food and uh, demand push inflation. So you've had cost of things ice going up due to supply chain issues, global supply chain issues. Then at the same time you also have excess money chasing the same group. So it's like a double whammy for this and We've already had uh, the U.S. talk about tapering, uh, reducing uh, the amount of uh, bonds that they're buying, uh, which means reduction in injection of liquidity. We've had them talk about raising rates to not expected. So you start to see various central banks you know, coming up to say, look, we spend so much money on inflated bubbles, and we need to find a way to start, you know, reining in and reducing this uh, this amount of bonds that we spend because. Creative bubbles will lead to another issue because creative bubbles also need to now start to have a bust and you now have to end up rejecting more liquidity again, which only does lead to increased inflationary pressure. So I think that uh, pressure to be around for a while, 
beyond 2021, definitely 2022, uh, we're likely to see uh, the supply chain issues uh, resolved. Maybe, maybe by mid 2022, it might get better. And then hopefully the central banks, uh, or the expectation that the central bank will start remaining on all the easing, the form of easing that, they, that they're doing, and that might you know, help reduce the inflationary rate. Okay, so let's also talk about something that many people have watched inside uh, this pandemic situation, and that has been the price of international crude oil. So the price of oil has passed about 80 US dollars a barrel for the first time in three years, and natural gas is the costliest it's been in seven years. It has also helped to push the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index to the highest level in a year as well. So we have some people saying that there is a gas crisis that is affecting Europe and is likely to last into winter, but there are also concerns um, with Bank of America analysts telling some people that there's a chance of oil reaching $100 a barrel, then becoming an economic crisis. For a country like Nigeria, Angola, a number of African countries that export crude, this would be a good thing, uh, the um, oil reaching $100 per barrel. But in the midst of the situation we find, some are terming it as an economic crisis. So sort of... Uh, um, explain how that would play out, particularly in relation to how it might affect an economy like Nigeria or an economy like Angola or anyone else here on the continent that has a huge um, oil export economy. Well, naturally, um, the higher the food oil price, the more receipts Nigeria will have for the sale of food oil, even though we are strong and even meet the current quota located to us by uh, OPEC, you know, the to shop prices. We shouldn't forget the fact that. OPEC members are still working based on reduced quota. Mm -hmm. And if uh, prices go up, this quota will certainly uh, increase, allow more supply, which would end up bringing down the price of crude oil. Uh, for Nigeria, it's a bit of a catch 22. And one of the major challenges that we have happens to be the oil source, the poor source. So, crude oil price goes up, we spend a lot more money on oil subsidy making it difficult for Nigeria to benefit from that. And crude oil price goes down, we spend less money on subsidy, but you have less USD receipts. Mm. So it's a tough one. And uh, I think other countries that are more uh, developed and have less of those type of subsidies generally will benefit a lot more from the increase in fuel, uh, crude oil, and gas prices. So if you have to look at, uh, say, some of the Middle East countries, that have better structure, that have less of this type of, uh, of, of subsidies tied directly to poor prices, then you see them benefit a lot more than Nigeria, for instance. And if you can check historically over the last five, six years or more, you see that uh, could oil price goes up, it's a problem in Nigeria. Could oil price come back down, it's still a problem in Nigeria. So mm -hmm. we need to solve that with the tough one, because if you were to remove the subsidy, then naturally the hardship business, but as it is right now, people are struggling to eat. We know it to have a huge impact on inflation and create a lot more hardship for especially the low income earners. So the question would be what kind of palliatives can we introduce? For so introduce palliatives, then we might have you know people build a whole industry of corruption around those palliatives to so all ways to benefit from them. And the same thing we are doing now with the subsidy. So the top one, and I wouldn't want to be the government right now trying to solve you know, this uh, complex you know, dynamic that I face. All right. So, Inamdi, as we wrap up, we've seen central banks in African countries um, do a number of interventions in order to sort of help the economy um, and the associated risks that have come. We've seen the IMF as well um, and the World Bank giving money in terms of helping African governments to stay afloat. All of these efforts, some adequate, some not enough, some beneficial, some questions arising. But when you put all of it together and then you look at the next three months that will make up the last quarter of 2021. What are your predictions? What 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 are your projections, particularly as we wind things down uh, for developing economies? How are we going to be able to come out of this and also maybe see um, a nice growth forecast as well as what we're seeing for developed economies? So I, I think for the developed economies, it's going to largely tied to vaccination. I think the more people that get vaccinated, the less restrictions they have and the easier it will be for them to get things back in track. 
developed economies also actually need the developed economies, uh, which are developed at the past to help them but to assist them in the better So we also need to hope that those countries get back on track, uh, which will help them render some sort of assistance. The IMF has been pretty helpful. Uh, they've been a good partner to develop the economies and we hope that they continue to support. We have activated all kinds of facilities to support from uh, rapid credit facility to debt forgiveness to SDR, plastic zone, $50 million. So uh, the support of IMF the Black people would help. The vaccine rollouts and developing economies would help. Um, even if it's just to kickstart the, for instance, even the tourism sector I mentioned earlier, you know, keep some countries looking at, uh, you know, fully vaccinated people not needed to quarantine and things like that. So we need to try and get all those things back on track, right? So the issue and the problem that's have existed in African countries with regards to bad governance and corruption are still there yeah. and only worsened by, you know, the various issues that are highlighted. And all we can do is just hope that somehow the issues get resolved and uh, we can start to get back on our feet. All right. Inam doing with you. Thank you so much. I'll see you again sometime soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. And of course, keeping an eye out on how the global economy is, of course, recovering in a year plus after COVID-19. As I said earlier, many people say that the recovery will be recorded in years and not in financial quarters. This is Business Edge. When we come back, a few stories to keep your eyes out for. And for NC4 to watch, we start here in Nigeria, where President Muhammadu Buhari is expected to present the 2022 budget on Thursday. He will address a joint session of the National Assembly to do so. Second on the list, rich countries are racing to close a climate finance shortfall of at least $10 billion, with a handful of European nations planning to increase their pledges this month ahead of crucial talks in Glasgow, Scotland. And we are hearing that over a decade ago, developed countries promised to mobilize $100 billion by 2020 to help countries, poor countries, deal with the worst impacts of global warming and invest in green energy sources. But they almost certainly missed their goal last year amid a pandemic that upended economies and as former U.S. President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Accord. Despite the slow economic growth, Kenya's tax man has surpassed its July 2021 revenue target with a surplus of 311 million Kenyan shillings after a revenue collection of 152.8 billion Kenyan shillings against the target, reflecting a performance rate of 100.2%. The KRA, that's the Kenya Revenue Authority, attributes good revenue performance in the first quarter of this financial year to improving the macroeconomic environment relaxation of COVID-19 measures and enhanced compliance efforts by the authority. And finally, Zimbabwe's annual inflation rates could end the year between 35% and 53%, up for an earlier estimate of 25 to 35%. Now, the central bank, in a statement shared on Monday, said that the local currency has dropped sharply on the black market. Policymakers in the southern African countries still are haunted by memories of hyperinflation and currency collapses have initially wanted to bring inflation to below 10% by the end of the year, but have revised that target higher twice now. And that's it on Business Edge. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. And of course, go to our YouTube and subscribe. So if you've missed any of our conversations, you can find them there. You can also download our mobile app and take us with you wherever you go and watch us across many of the platforms. We're live on Star Times 274, Avo Channel 23, uh, Freeview, as well as many other platforms. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Rubalogo. I'll see you again soon.